February 14th, 2008. Valentine's Day. Northern Illinois University. A 27-year-old graduate student guns down six students in their classroom, then takes his own life. Violent acts like this seem commonplace. Over the next two hours, we'll examine 15 shocking acts of violence. School shootings, workplace homicides, and shopping mall massacres. We'll remember the victims, hear from the survivors. I looked into his eyes and then saw down the barrel of his gun. And honor the heroes. He had the gun aimed right at her head, and when I knocked him off balance just enough, that the bullet missed her and hit her computer screen. Stories of courage in the face of unspeakable carnage. This is Going Postal, 15 most shocking acts of violence. Arkansas afternoon. Students and teachers at Westside Middle School in Jonesboro had just finished their lunches. For five of them, it would be their last meal. Shocking act of violence number 15. The Jonesboro Middle School Massacre. The nation was shocked at the severity of this crime and at the age of the shooters. Family members said 11-year-old Andrew Golden was a typical kid who loved hunting with his grandfather. Andrew Golden was raised with guns all of his life. His grandfather was a firearms dealer, collected guns, and they taught Andrew how to use them. By many accounts, 13-year-old Mitchell Johnson was a confused adolescent, but adults were often impressed with his impeccable manners. He was very respectful, always said yes ma'am, anytime he was ever approached. As far as I knew, Mitchell was just a normal kid. Neither boy seemed particularly prone to violence. But on March 24th, 1998, that changed. They began their day by uh, Mitchell stealing the family van. After Mitchell obtained the van from his house, he went to Golden's neighborhood and picked up Andrew Golden. They burglarized uh, the grandfather's house, got inside, and took a number of weapons. They set up their stash of guns in the uh, wooded line by the school, and Andrew Golden left the wooded area and walked over to the middle school complex and went in by the office door. Officials reported at 12.35 p.m., Andrew Golden completed the next step in the boy's plan. He reached over, grabbed the fire alarm, pulled it down, ran back to the wooded area where Mitchell Johnson was waiting for him. They positioned themselves in an area where they were able to create what a sniper would call a killing field. They had a field of view of where students might populate. Both the boys had a tremendous amount of ammunition on them and several firearms and, uh, as I recall, some knives. They knew when they pulled that fire alarm that they would go out that doorway. They went out like they were supposed to, and that's when all hell broke loose. Students and teachers filed out the side entrance of the sixth grade wing. Andrew and Mitchell immediately opened fire. They didn't have to aim. All they had to do was point their weapons in that direction, pull the trigger, and they would hit someone. Some of the students said they began to hear, hear what sounded like firecrackers popping, and then they could see red spots appearing on clothing. They're thinking, well, somebody's shooting paintballs. But the pain and the panic set in, they realized this isn't firecrackers, this isn't paintballs, somebody's shooting at us. I look and I see one of my teachers on the ground. I see another student laying on the sidewalk. All I could think of was, we have to get down. 11-year-old Natalie Brooks was the first victim. Within seconds, 12-year-old Stephanie Johnson was also killed. Then, 11-year-old Brittany Varner and 12-year-old Paige Herring lost their lives. It was like some kind of battle scene. We had kids laying on the ground. We had blood everywhere. As the children panicked, the actions of their teachers averted an even greater tragedy. The teachers immediately began to try to get the students out of the line of fire and around the corner of that building and inside the gymnasium. Teachers should never be put in the position of having to protect their children with their bodies. But that's what some of these teachers did, and some of them lost their lives. Teacher Shannon Wright was one such hero. She was a young, energetic, creative teacher. 
She taught language arts. She brought out a lot of creativity in the students because she would share things that were important to her in her life. Everybody loved Miss Wright. I've had kids in the last 10 years come up to me that are adults now and say, you know, Shannon was such a great teacher. That's neat because I, that's something I can tell my son about. The 32-year-old wife and mother helped direct sixth grader Emma Pittman away from the gunman. Shannon grabbed Emma and when she turned her around, she was actually struck in the back and in the left knee. And the one in the back that actually went through her rib cage and into her liver and is the one that did the, the, the damage. Shannon Wright was the last person to die that day. I learned a very valuable lesson about telling someone goodbye because that morning was probably one of the few mornings that I did not tell her goodbye before I left. In just four minutes, Johnson and Golden fired 22 rounds, killing five and wounding 10. I go up on the scene with my camera and it's like a war zone. There are bloody clothes, bloody towels, and there are dead kids. It really just kind of rips your heart out that somebody came in and shot all these kids up for no reason. According to police, Johnson and Golden ran for their getaway vehicle as police and SWAT units swarmed the school. The sheriff's office is located very close to the school, four or five miles, and we were, were able to respond and we caught them very quickly. They reverted from being these methodical machines who had set out a killing field to being little children again and crying and asking for their mothers. There was a lot of anger, a lot of questions of why did they do this? Who were they targeting? Had they been planning this? The community was still stunned when the trial was taking place as they were the day that the crime took place. They were broken hearted. 13 year old Mitchell Johnson admitted his guilt at trial. 11 year old Andrew Golden didn't testify, but his lawyer acknowledged Andrew's participation in the crime. When it's all said and done, there's just two little boys that caused this crime to take place. There were so many areas of the story that really shook that town to its core. On August 11th, 1998, Johnson and Golden were convicted on five counts of capital murder and 10 counts of battery. They were tried as juveniles, sent to a juvenile detention center, ultimately to a federal center after they reached the age of 18. At 21, they were both released with a clean record. Johnson got out of prison in 2005 after serving less than eight years for the shootings. Golden was released two years later in 2007. They are allowed to be free and do anything that they basically want to. That creates a certain amount of fear because what is to say that they might not do it again? I'm not aware of any remorse shown by either one of them. Neither one has ever made any statements as to why they did this. Even though it's been 10 years, you know, every, every morning when I, when I wake that, that boy up, I, I, I still see his mom. When I put him in bed at night, I still see his mom. When he laughs and he kind of looks at me in a funny way, he'll do things that, that, that I don't mean, help his mom. I wish more than anybody that there would have been a sign that I could have at least acted upon or checked out. I can honestly say I had no idea that anything like this was gonna ever happen. All I can do is take what I've learned from it and try to move forward. Coming up, one woman's attempt to stop an unspeakable tragedy. A sanctuary full of worshipers, a man with a gun and a grudge. All that stands between the churchgoers and tragedy is a lone security guard. Shocking act of violence number 14 is the Colorado church shootings. Anyone that has a public meeting place, churches, malls, whatever, they need to have a contingency plan in place. And fortunately for us, for many years, we have prepared for the absolute worst. Well, on December 9th, the absolute worst happened. December 9th, 2007 was the day that Matthew Murray decided to unleash carnage. 24-year-old Matthew Murray lived in the upscale suburb of Inglewood, Colorado with his parents and his 21-year-old brother. He had a very religious mother who was very strict with him. She would search his room for DVDs and CDs and music to make sure he wasn't listening to anything or watching anything that she didn't approve of. He was feeling rejected, ostracized, a lot of angst for being essentially a prisoner in his own home. 
As a teenager, Murray enrolled in a Christian outreach program called Youth with a Mission, also known as YWAM. He was the type of person this church was trying to help, but he was also a very troubled person. He was dismissed for uh, some behavioral problems and health problems. That was several years ago. He just never could get past that. Five years after he was expelled, Murray returned to the YWAM branch in nearby Arvada, Colorado. Instead of a Bible, he carried a backpack full of guns and ammunition. You've got a mental health issue and you have a person who's well-armed, and that's really a bad combination. Shortly after 12.30 a.m., Murray asked staffers at the center if he could stay the night. When they refused, Murray shot and killed 26-year-old Tiffany Johnson and 23-year-old Philip Krause. Two more people were injured. The shooter then fled the scene. Twelve hours later on Sunday afternoon, Murray showed up 70 miles south of Arvada at New Life Church. Thousands of families were on the grounds of the Colorado Springs Religious Center. Former Minneapolis police officer Jean Assam was a member of the church. She was also working security that day. I saw it on my computer that Sunday morning that there had been a shooting at this religious facility. I saw that the gunman was still on the loose and I got chills. I just, I don't know why, but I had a feeling he was going to come to new life. About 1.10 p.m., Matthew pulled into the parking lot. He took a smoke grenade and threw it on one end of the building to divert our volunteer security team. Drove his car down to the other end of the building. Eyewitnesses say he put his head on the steering wheel for a few minutes. A few spaces down, the Works family was in their car, preparing to leave the church. When he got up, he opened the car door, put a um, magazine into his assault rifle, got out and walked real purposely toward the Works family. I believe I heard a pop, looked over my shoulder and saw a guy in black with an assault rifle. As Murray began shooting, David Works watched helplessly as his 16-year-old daughter Rachel was hit. She fell back onto the pavement. I saw him again point the gun and felt my belly rip and fell to the pavement, not having gotten to Rachel all the way. Meanwhile, David's wife, Marie, witnessed the shooting of another daughter, 18-year-old Stephanie. I thought, she's been hit in the head. That, And then I started to look for a pulse, and I couldn't find a pulse. Stephanie died instantly. I wasn't sad at that point, because I knew she was in a good place. Still shooting, the gunman wounded two more people as he walked toward the entrance. I had my gun out, and people were screaming and running past me and sideways into hallways and rooms and bathrooms to hide. And then I heard someone say, there he is, Gene. He's coming in the doors right now. Gina Sam, by this time, had strategically placed herself in the hall. She did not know that Matthew would come into the doorway with an AR-15, a thousand rounds of ammunition strapped to his body, and two loaded pistols. Murray was prepared to kill hundreds, but Gina Sam wasn't about to let that happen. I said, uh, police officer, drop your weapon, and I shot him five times, and uh, he shot at me four times. The bullet holes in the wall behind me showed that he should have hit me, but he didn't. Wounded, Matthew Murray fell to the floor. He then put his 9 millimeter pistol to his head and fired. Had it not been for Gina Som, the rampage would have continued. Either way, this woman's a hero. It shows what having someone who's been trained and tested and prepared uh, for the shootout situation, how that can make a difference in saving lives. Jean refuses to take all the credit for her heroic deeds. She has another explanation. As soon as I stepped out from behind cover, I felt uh, a, just a, a rock-solid protective shield around me. And I'm not kidding, just like I could feel God. In the aftermath of the killings, investigators determined Murray frequently posted anti-Christian tirades on the Internet. The biggest thing is getting schools, campuses, or companies to take it seriously, and what we tell them is if they broadcast it, you believe it. 
and you take action. We don't live in a culture where we have the luxury of ignoring red flags because of the potential for this kind of serious violence. Two communities struggled with grief and anger. The parents of the two slain girls, Rachel and Stephanie Works, met with the parents of the gunmen at New Life Church. To see the family of the murdered daughters embrace the family of the shooter and ask one another to for, forgive and uh, ask one another to, to pray for them, it was pretty amazing. Both families also met Jean Assam. And I'll never forget what Ron Murray said to her. The dad of the shooter looked at her and said, we're so sorry that our son fired at you, and we want you to know you did the right thing. Up next, stocks, bonds, and bloodshed. To his co-workers, he was a nice guy. To his Boy Scout troop, he was a trusted leader until something snapped and led to shocking act of violence number 13, the Atlanta Day Trader murders. 44-year-old Mark Barton was a day trader looking for a fast track to fortune, but the market was not kind to Barton. Alltech Investment Group was the second firm in Atlanta to revoke his trading privileges. He had put in about $50,000 initially with us. Uh, he went through all of that money. Uh, came back in and uh, replenished his account, so to speak, and over the next few months went through that money as well. He hated the people, he said, that had basically come to cause his destructive end and ruin, and he was out to get revenge. On July 29th, 1999, Barton showed up at the Atlanta offices of Momentum Securities, the first company that shut him off. Found the manager of, of the office, and uh, started with him, shot and killed him, and then went around the office basically taking aim at, at anybody and everybody. But Mark Barton was just getting started. Alltech was right across the street from the scene of Barton's first shooting spree. Office manager Brent Doonan was in the conference room when Barton arrived. He opened the door, poked his head in, and said uh, with a smile on his face, come here, you're gonna love this. I excused myself from the meeting, and at that point, he, he pulled up his shirt, pulled out two guns, and just started shooting. The first shot hit me right in the chest. Uh, the second one in my right arm uh, collapsed me to the floor. And then we turned around and walked out. It was a big, long day trading table, and just started going down the line, just shooting one after another after another. Wounded but still conscious, Dunan fought back. He was taking aim at one of our traders, uh, Nell. She was about four feet from him, and he had the gun uh, aimed right at her head. And when I hit him, knocked him off balance just enough that the, uh, the bullet missed her and hit her computer screen instead. He was able to shoot me uh, three more times uh, in the back and in the arm. Um, then I made my escape down the hallway uh, to a service elevator. By the time Brent Doonan was wounded, police and SWAT teams arrived at the scene of the first shooting. Barton managed to elude police. Thus far, we have nine confirmed fatalities. The person that's been identified as the perpetrator is Mark O. Barton. Barton was on the run. He didn't get far. At around 7.45 p.m., police cornered Barton's minivan at a gas station. Barton put his Colt 45 against his temple and fired. But the grisly story wasn't over. Later that evening at Barton's home in Stockbridge, Georgia, police found the bodies of his wife and two children. Barton killed them with a hammer two days before his workplace rampage. All told, Mark Barton killed 12 people, including his wife and children. Once you go back and you look at the research on this guy, it starts to sink in that this was a very mentally ill person that, you know, the rest of society didn't really pinpoint. I certainly never saw it. The shooting stunned the nation. But just four days after the tragedy, Alltech reopened for business. So we had a crisis management firm that was right above us. They came in immediately after the, the shooting. Um, we're basically in charge of doing some of the counseling. 
uh, to help our traders kind of cope with, with what had happened. I sat down with them personally and said, let's talk about, you know, what you can expect. Before you know it, everybody's kind of going over, checking out what the stocks are doing and how their, their, their stocks have been, and we got them right back to work. Brent Doonan spent two weeks in the hospital recovering from his injuries. On September 29th, he too returned to work. Over the course of uh, the surgeries, they ended up taking a portion of my left lung, third of my liver, part of my diaphragm, my spleen, and a rib. But uh, everything else is still kicking so far. In 2006, Brent wrote a book about the horrible events of that July day in 1999. You can hit rock bottom, you can pick up the pieces and, and move on, and ultimately, to me anyway, this is a story of living. A rustic Scottish town, 29 school children, four loaded handguns, one deranged man. Shocking act of violence number 12 is the Dunblane Primary School shooting. 2005, there were 23 gun murders in Great Britain total. We have 32 a day in the United States. The relative lack of gun violence in the UK makes the events of March 13, 1996 even harder to comprehend. At 9.25 a.m., a 43-year-old former scout leader named Thomas Hamilton entered the Dunblane Primary School in Dunblane, Scotland. He was carrying four uh, handguns. Three of them uh, were 9 millimeter semi-automatic, and another was a revolver. Hamilton made his way to the gymnasium. Mr. Hamilton thought that the assembly began at 9.30. His plan was to go into the room where the assembly was being held and simply massacre. But there was no assembly. Instead, Hamilton found three teachers and 29 five and six year olds preparing for physical education class. Without a word, he opened fire. 44 year old teacher Gwen Mayer tried to shield students with her body. She was one of the first to die. There were two other teachers present, and they ushered the children, tried to get as many of them as they could into the storage room where they were told to lie down. Children screamed and ran. Hamilton chased them down, firing as he went. It was a combination of wild shooting and very deliberate uh, target shooting. Sixteen first graders and one teacher were killed. Twelve more students and two teachers were seriously wounded. In the end, Hamilton turned the gun on himself. When authorities searched Hamilton's home, they found evidence of a consuming obsession. I don't think it would be a stretch to say that he had an unhealthy interest in young boys. Several theories surfaced about Hamilton's motives that fateful day. He uh, felt victimized because for so many years he had been denied permission to start his boys clubs. Hamilton grew increasingly enraged and as a result he uh, decided to exact revenge. There is no more powerful way to exact vengeance against one's tormentors than by killing their children. After the shootings, an outraged nation persuaded the House of Commons to ban handguns over 22 caliber. Great Britain now has some of the strictest gun control laws in the world. I think it's amazing that in, in Britain, after a tragedy occurs, they took steps uh, to prevent them from occurring again in the future. And that's what we don't do in the United States. The gym where the massacre took place was torn down the following month. And within two years, the entire Dunblane Primary School was rebuilt. They wanted all signs of that event to be removed. That school had become a place of horror. A memorial to the 16 slain students and their teacher stands in a nearby cemetery. When we return, a horrific last meal. Seventeen-year-old Alberto Leos had just been hired at his first job. Forty-one-year-old James Huberty had just been fired from his last. 
Their paths crossed in shocking act of violence number 11, the San Ysidro McDonald's massacre. July 18th, 1984, in the Southern California town of San Ysidro, just two miles north of the Mexican border. Local resident James Huberty and his family spent the morning at the nearby San Diego Zoo. James Huberty had a history of paranoia and he also collected guns. Guns and mental illness don't mix. When Huberty left his home later that afternoon, he made a grisly announcement to his wife. This is a guy who said beforehand, I'm going hunting, hunting for humans. Huberty took a duffel bag containing a pistol, a shotgun, and a semi-automatic rifle and got into his battered Mercury marquee. It was around four in the afternoon when he arrived at the McDonald's two blocks from his apartment. He calmly got out of the car and shot a couple of boys who were riding around their bikes. He walked inside the restaurant and just uh, without warning started shooting. I uh, was working in the back stocking up uh, the uh, freezers getting ready for the rush hour that comes in. I heard some shots in the front of the McDonald's. That's when I realized that something, something definitely was wrong. The assault was methodical and relentless. He told everyone to get to the ground, uh, just to get lay on the floor. And right away he started killing people up front. Before he was done, Huberty fired more than 300 rounds of ammunition. Those who ran were shot in the back. Those who didn't were shot point blank. At least four people were killed outside the restaurant as they tried to escape the carnage. Leos and three others hid in a backroom storage area. They were behind the counter as well with me and they got scared right away so they kind of ducked to the ground and they just stood there emotionless while he was out front uh, executing everyone. As the smoke cleared, Huberty followed the sound of Alberto's sobbing co-workers. When we looked up, he was just appeared out of nowhere. Right away, he started shooting at us. Alberto and his fellow employees were left for dead. My friends were with me, they, they were killed, and um, I was shot five times, and he ran out of ammunition. And uh, he went to the front to reload. I ended up uh, crawling uh, from where we were hiding. I crawled to the back of the McDonald's, I crawled downstairs, and I crawled into a closet. San Diego police arrived seven minutes after the shooting started. We had to assume it was some type of robbery that had gone bad. He came out and, 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 and walked around shooting. Once he went inside, we could not see him very well. That's why it took so long. We couldn't make entry because we didn't know how many suspects were inside. We were waiting for the rest of the SWAT team to respond. This was one of the cases where they sat back and said, we need to very quickly have lethal rules of engagement, which enable our officers to very quickly take a life to save a life. From 112 yards away, a police marksman waited patiently for an opening. Sergeant uh, Chuck Foster, who was up on the roof right across from the McDonald's, was able to catch a glimpse of him walking around in front of the counter area and was able to take that shot and he took him out with one round. 77 minutes of pure death and destruction at a McDonald's where people go for Happy Meals, for Super Size Me. It's not a place that you expect this type of thing to happen. When we pulled up on the outside of it and started walking in, you stepped over people that had been shot and had expired um, that were laying out on the sidewalk. I saw a couple of children laying outside, unfortunately, near their bikes. They were motionless and trying to fight for their lives. 20 dead. Another 20 lay wounded and bleeding. You could just see, you know, people laying everywhere. And it was just a matter of trying to figure out who was still alive and who was wounded and who you could care for. The subsequent investigation revealed the gunman knew he had mental health issues. The day prior to the attack, the subject had called a mental health facility, a kind of a hotline, and his name had been misspelled and he didn't receive a return call. The question is, with a man who was so angry, a man who was going to take matters into his own hands, whether any mental health professional would be able to engage him in any kind of treatment that would make a difference. Alberto Leos faced a long road to recovery. I had five surgeries to remove the bullets from my arms, my leg, and my stomach. 
I went to rehab for a year and a half. I saw a psychologist for a year. It uh, took about 10 years after the incident to finally close the last chapter. Three years after the shooting, Alberto fulfilled his lifelong dream of becoming a police officer. Every day when I get up and I look myself in the mirror, I see the scars, so it's always a constant reminder because I'll always have them. But I'm still real grateful that um, I'm alive and I'm still living out the, uh, those goals and dreams that I've had since I was a kid. Coming up on Going Postal, a gunman turns a college campus into a killing field. Before there was Columbine, before there was Oklahoma City, there was the tower at the University of Texas and shocking act of violence number 10. 1966 was a year of turmoil in America. Protests for civil rights and against the Vietnam War dominated the headlines. 1966 was also the year America's first public mass murder took place. Charles Whitman showed us that a person who was well armed and who knew what he was doing could do a great deal of danger in a very short time and uh, get a lot of attention while doing it. The date, August 1st. 25-year-old architectural engineering student Charles Whitman took the elevator to the top of the University of Texas Tower in Austin. Well, it was a typical sunny summer day that he was going to class like you, know, you usually would. You know, there was, there was nothing to suggest there was anything out of the ordinary. Whitman dragged a footlocker full of weapons, ammo, and food. His arsenal included an Army-issue rifle and a semi-automatic M1 carbine. Once he got up to the reception area and had murdered the uh, receptionist up there, he wanted to block access to the outside deck. He took the dolly that he had rented and had used to bring the footlocker up uh, and wedged it against the outside of the glass panel door. Below him, hundreds of students and civilians milled about the UT campus. Whitman fired his first shot at 11.48 a.m. The bullet struck 18-year-old freshman Claire Wilson, who was eight months pregnant at the time. The next bullet struck her boyfriend. My parents had left me and gone out of town for a couple of weeks, and they had hired these two college kids to come stay with me, and I'd gotten very close to them. And it turns out they were the t first two people shot by him. And the woman lost her baby, and, and the guy lost his life. He was shot through the head. Another student was gunned down while eating a sandwich in the front yard of a frat house five blocks away. Within a few seconds, a high-power rifle shot came past my right ear, and it hit the gentleman who was standing inside the little newsstand right next door to the drugstore. One man was shot in the doorway of a barber shop more than a quarter mile from the tower. He was able to lean over with his high-powered rifle, with a scope, and shoot in any direction he wanted to shoot. At that day and time, uh, in the society we were living in, it just didn't dawn on you that something like that would happen. So I think people, out of curiosity, went out and just thought, I'm safe, I'm, you know, I'm several blocks away and I'm safe. And uh, unfortunately, that was not the case. Nobody within view of the tower was safe. First off, he was a, he was a Marine trained sharpshooter. He evidently had been handling guns since he was a kid. Despite all of Whitman's preparations, one thing he didn't plan for was the swift response of well-armed civilians. Anybody with a gun was welcome to pull it out and, and take shots at him. By doing that, they kept him pinned down. They probably saved a lot of lives by doing it. I know it sounds wild west, but by having a whole bunch of guns on the ground on him, he couldn't look over the railing anymore. He had to go down to the drain spouts that were at the bottom, and that limited what he could do. Austin patrolman Houston McCoy was one of the officers on the scene. McCoy took the elevator to the 27th floor of the tower. There, he met up with officers Ray Martinez and Jerry Day, 
along with a civilian who was also hoping to stop the gunman. When uh, they got the door open, I believe Martinez went out first, Houston went out second. Martinez turned back around on all four, and we made our way up to the northeast corner. At the same time, Officer Jerry Day and civilian Alan Crum had hit on the south deck. And uh, for whatever reason, Alan Crum had had a rifle he was unfamiliar with thrust into his hands. He let out a round and it smacked into the west wall. So that got Whitman's attention. Martinez immediately sprayed six shots out of his revolver. And within a split second after that, Houston McCoy let two shots out of his shotgun. I shot the shotgun and hit him right square in the face first. His old head just started bouncing every which way. So I jacked in another shot and uh, then I shot him in his left hand side. 97 minutes after the shooting started, Charles Whitman lay dead atop the University of Texas clock tower. The ex Marine shot 43 people that day. The death toll reached 15. All you can see where people had gotten shot is pretty gory. I gotta tell you, it was like a battlefield. In his suicide note, Whitman requested an autopsy. Doctors discovered a pecan sized lump at the base of his brain stem. Experts disagree whether the tumor triggered Whitman's violent outburst. The incident changed the way police departments across the nation operate. Yeah, the University of Texas shooting was sort of the inception, I think, of a lot of the SWAT teams and, and understanding that you had to have a whole new way of policing a response to something like this. In 2007, 41 years after the attack, the city of Austin honored 13 people for their bravery in the face of exceptional danger. Everybody should have credit for what they did up there that day. This was something that needed to be done. And it just took, uh, it took all of us. This was pretty, it's a pretty big deal. Wasn't no one man show. When we continue, a speeding train filled with commuters trapped by a gunman with a murderous grudge. On December 7, 1993, hundreds of commuters boarded a train to Hicksville, New York. Six of them never made it home. Shocking act of violence number nine, the Long Island Railroad Massacre. It was a normal end to a typical workday. Penn Station in New York City, stockbrokers, secretaries, and students boarded the 5.33 p.m. train. The Long Island Railroad is one of the main commuter trains in and out of Manhattan. I'm usually on a 4.55 train every single day. And this day, I realized I only had like five minutes to get over there to catch my 4.55. And I said, oh, what's the rush? So I missed my earlier train, my normal train. But nothing about this trip would be normal. There was another passenger on board who was not a regular, 35-year-old Colin Ferguson. Mr. Ferguson takes the very rear seat where everyone sit seated immediately in front of him is facing away from him. There's nobody that is looking at him when he begins his, his shooting spree. Ten minutes into the ride, Ferguson drew a 9 millimeter Ruger pistol. That's when I first heard the first pops and it was the sounds of gunshots. At first I thought it was actually firecrackers from outside. I realized it wasn't from outside the train. It was actually inside the train and it was to my right. And I saw Colin Ferguson methodically shooting people in the shoulders and the head. He just barely even blinked. He just looked from one side to the other, never said anything, looked at a person lying on the floor, aimed at that person and fired. The last thing I wanted to do was get up, look him in the eyes and watch him shoot me. So I just decided I was going to make a run down the center of the train towards the other end of the car. And he said, if he's going to shoot me, let him shoot me in the back. Somehow, Kevin McHugh was able to avoid Ferguson's gunfire. But passenger Dennis McCarthy was not so lucky. He was shot and killed instantly. Seated next to Dennis was his 24-year-old son, Kevin. He was shot in the head. He is now walking toward the east end of the train arbitrarily just shooting people as they're lying on the floor and shooting straight ahead to the mass of people that have gathered. He finishes his second clip, which is now 30 rounds fired. 
As Ferguson reloaded for a second time, three courageous passengers brought him down. Three guys just jumped, you know, threw him down into the seat to hold him down at that point. He would have returned to his seat, reloaded his weapon, and at least fired another 15 rounds. He easily could have doubled the amount of injuries and carnage. Four passengers slumped dead in their seats. Two more died at the hospital, and 19 were wounded. I've seen a lot of sights, but not with the multitude of victims that this particular case had. I've never seen anything so devastating. Hours later, Joyce Gorecki was still waiting for her husband, Jim, who was a regular on the 533. At 10.30, the doorbell rings, and uh, there was two police detectives that were standing at the door. I said to them, he's dead, isn't he? And they said, yes, and I fell to the floor. Dennis McCarthy's wife, Carolyn, was returning home from her job as a nurse. Carolyn's brother met her as she pulled into the driveway. He just blurted out that there was a shooting on the Long Island Railroad, and Dennis was dead. We had to get over to North Shore University Hospital because Kevin was taken there. He had been shot in the head. He did not have a very good chance of survival. Kevin did survive Ferguson's murder spree, but his condition was grave. They did not know if he survived, if he'd ever walk again, whether he'd ever speak again. They just didn't know if there was a chance of recovery, would he be a vegetable? One year after the massacre, Colin Ferguson stood trial. Both friends and psychiatrists painted the Jamaican-born killer as an angry man with a score to settle. In his pocket were about seven pages of handwritten notes. The notes indicated that he was mad at the world. He was uh, mad at Afro-Americans, he was mad at Asian-Americans, he was mad at various Caucasians. Ferguson pleaded not guilty to 93 separate counts. He chose to represent himself. During the trial, he referred to himself oftentimes in the third person. The witnesses dealt with this by using the first person. Did you see Colin Ferguson shoot somebody? I saw you shoot, says the witness. People who this man intended to kill had to come to court and sit on the witness stand and suffer the indignity of having this murderous killer cross-examine them and ask them questions as if he was innocent. On February 17, 1995, Colin Ferguson was convicted and sentenced to six consecutive life sentences. The thing we were trying to understand the most when we arrested Colin Ferguson was, why did he do this? Why did he pick that train? Why did he pick those people? Two women who lost their husbands to the senseless violence were inspired to take action. Joyce Gorecki became an anti-gun crusader. I don't want it to happen to you. And unfortunately, everybody that walks around is at risk because we're having more and more shootings going on. Carolyn McCarthy launched a political career. A terrible tragedy happened to my family and the other families. I'm not gonna allow anyone else to go through what we went through. In 1996, Carolyn McCarthy was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. It's now my job to take what I've learned and try to help other people along the way. And I do believe with all my heart and soul that one person can make a difference Four years after the tragedy, Kevin McCarthy defied the odds and walked down the aisle with his new bride, Leslie Nolan. It was in a dry eye in the place because everybody was thinking the same thing. Here he was getting married when none of us were wondering whether he would have survived that night. Miracles do happen. Coming up, one man takes on an entire city. Usually, the perpetrators of violent shooting sprees are men, angry, tormented, disenfranchised. But on rare occasions, the deranged gunman is a woman. Case in point, random act of violence number eight, the Goleta Post Office murders. This was a woman who everyone uh, in law enforcement knew was trouble waiting to happen. Jennifer San Marco began her killing spree around 8 p.m. on January 30th, 2006. She went back to a neighbor's home who she had had previous altercations with and murdered the woman. 
After she shot Beverly Graham, Jennifer drove across town to her former place of employment, a U.S. Postal Service mail sorting facility. Then she waited. Friends and neighbors and acquaintances reported seeing her sometimes talking to herself. In the workplace, she had altercations with other employees. And in one situation prior to this event, the police had been called and deputies had, had removed her in handcuffs. That incident back in 2001 landed San Marco in a mental hospital for 72 hours. She eventually left the post office and moved to rural New Mexico in 2003. In August 2006, despite her history of mental illness, San Marco was able to purchase a 9mm pistol at a pawn shop in Grants, New Mexico. Jennifer San Marco filled out the forms, got the gun and ammunition she needed, and then proceeded to carry out her plan. Five months later, San Marco patiently sat outside the sorting facility in Goleta. Jennifer San Marco obtained access to the mail sorting facility by waiting for a vehicle to pass through the gate. And as that vehicle passed through the gate and the gate opened, she tailgated and was able to just draft right in with the person in front. She shot and killed two employees in the parking lot before entering the building. She then was just one step away by getting an ID card to being able to swipe it through the door. Then she goes inside and she starts a one by one shooting people. 80 workers were on duty that night. Some frantically dialed 911 as San Marco searched for victims. When police officers entered the building, they found Jennifer San Marco dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Five post office employees were also dead. A sixth died later from her wounds. It's the deadliest incident by a female shooter in U.S. history. San Marco left no note and apparently spoke to no one about her plans. In so many of these cases, it, it boils down to a couple of things. One, the gun laws in this country, and two, the way we treat people with mental illness. Clearly, what we're doing now to keep dangerous people from getting guns isn't working. And that's because we have so few restrictions. And this postal shooting is another good example. A stolen tank charges through the streets of a U.S. city. A police officer is determined to stop the man behind the controls. A confrontation leaves one of them dead. Shocking act of violence number seven is the San Diego tank rampage. On the evening of May 17, 1995, a former army private named Sean Timothy Nelson entered the San Diego National Guard Armory. It was after hours, after five, evidently, and he was able to get in very easily because there were people working late and left the gate unlocked. The 35-year-old broke into one tank, then another, trying to start the engines. On the third try, Nelson succeeded. Right, he used to be a crew member in the U.S. Army of a tank, so he knew all about tanks. The only fortunate thing was this was not a loaded tank. It didn't have all its missiles and things on board. Nelson drove the 53-ton M60 tank out of the armory and onto the streets of San Diego. I can honestly say it was a parade atmosphere. Everybody was joking and laughing. And then he started mowing down cars and vans, and it wasn't so funny when he started heading for people. The driver barreled across San Diego, targeting everything in his path. Just as I got out of the driveway, he ran over my truck. Yeah. And then he took out the telephone poles over there. Dozens of San Diego cops were dispatched to investigate. How do you stop a tank? And that's basically what the police were faced with. They couldn't. Their only option was to clear the streets ahead of the vehicle until Nelson veered onto the freeway. There were um, police cars that had stopped traffic on both sides of the freeway. So there was no risk to other human life unless he made it over the barrier and started down again. Police speculate he was heading towards a busy local hospital. It was determined that he was in a lawsuit with the hospital. Some believe that part of his rage was the fact that he had been improperly treated. When the tank became hung up on the freeway divider, police saw an opportunity and took immediate action. That was the police signal to get in there and disarm him. As soon as that happened, the police 
were out of their cars and they were on top of the tank getting the turret open. Using bolt cutters, four San Diego police officers forced open the hatch and found Nelson at the controls. They ordered him to surrender. He didn't comply with the authorities. They tried to beg him to stop, to stop the tank, to give himself up. San Diego police officer Rick Piner was left with no option. Uh, the decision was made to shoot. And they felt if he had gotten across the way, then he would definitely kill a lot of people. Remarkably, Nelson was the only person killed that day. His 22-minute rampage destroyed 40 vehicles, damaged six miles of road, and left thousands of people without power. Tests on Nelson's blood showed he was intoxicated. This is a guy who was suicidal, had been having drug abuse problems, methamphetamine, had lost both his parents in the several years leading up to this incident. Five weeks after the incident, the San Diego district attorney found Officer Piner was justified in using lethal force. Coming up, a Texas diner becomes a death trap. crowded cafeteria, an armed and angry man, for dozens, a brutal and bloody last meal. Shocking act of violence number six, the Luby's Cafeteria Massacre. October 16th, 1991. Luby's Cafeteria was a popular dining destination for working people in Killeen, Texas. Shortly after 12.40 p.m., the busy restaurant was packed with regulars, including 32-year-old Susanna Grasha Hupp and her parents, Al and Ursula. It was a beautiful day in the middle of fall, and um, we had finished eating, and the place was packed that day. The bustling lunchtime atmosphere was about to be shattered. As we finished eating, uh, all of a sudden a truck just blasted through a floor-to-ceiling window that was right where we used to sit. Knocked over a number of tables, hurt quite a few people, and it came to rest well within the restaurant itself. Of course, everybody thought it was a wreck, and the people jumped up to help the people that got hit and got to help the driver of the truck. But this was no random accident. 35-year-old unemployed merchant seaman George Hennard jumped from the cab of the pickup. He immediately opened fire with a Glock 17 semi-automatic pistol. All of a sudden, my father and I heard shots. Uh, we immediately got down on the floor and put the table up in front of us. My mom got down behind us and realized in 1991, these random shootings weren't happening. So my first thought was, it's a robbery. but. He just kept shooting. Hennard moved quickly through the crowd, firing at random. I used to carry a gun in my purse, which at that time in the state of Texas was illegal. My gun was 100 yards away in my car, completely useless to me. My father took my attention, and he began to raise up, and he said, I gotta do something, I gotta do something. He's gonna kill everybody in here. And I tried to hold him down by his shirt collar, but when he saw what he thought was an opportunity, he got up and he ran at the man. And the guy simply just turned and shot him. Many customers dove under tables to escape the gunman, only to be shot as they hid. It's a cafeteria-style restaurant, and the people in the serving area had no furniture for protection, no barriers. They hit the floor, but were completely exposed, and many people in this area were shot and killed. The shooter paused just briefly to shove another clip into his weapon. He was walking from one person to the next, taking aim and pulling the trigger. He'd go to the next person, take aim, pull the trigger. He had complete control over the situation. Employees rushed out the back door or sought refuge within the restaurant. And two employees were able to escape by hiding. One woman hid in the large refrigerator and another young man squeezed into an industrial dishwasher and he stayed there for 24 hours. Another man made his own escape route. Tommy Vaughn dove through the window, put his entire body through it 
broke it, and many people were able to escape out that back window. Or when I heard that window break at the back of the restaurant, I thought, oh God, here comes another one. But then I saw people getting out that way. And when I saw what, what I thought was a chance, I stood up, I grabbed my mother by the shirt collar, I said, come on, come on, we gotta run, we gotta get out of here. And then my feet grew wings. And I turned around to say something to my mother, and that's when I realized that she had not followed me out. Mrs. Grasha stayed behind to comfort Susan's dad. And they said he pointed a gun at her head and pulled the trigger. My parents had just had their 47th wedding anniversary, and uh, my mom wasn't going anywhere without dad. Police investigator Kenneth Olson was among the first to arrive on the scene. You could smell a gunfire in the air. As I approached the building, I saw that he was getting ready to shoot somebody on the ground. I could see him holding a gun. I fired my pistol and I shot him. That stopped him from shooting anyone else and he started to run. At that time, I, I fired some more rounds at the uh, suspect's position and then the guy shot himself at that point in time. The shooting spree lasted just 12 minutes. 22 victims lay dead with another 21 wounded. Paramedics rushed to help the survivors. So when I went in that door, and I just knew we had to go to work, and I knew there was a lot of people, so we had to start getting up into the ones that could be saved out of there. Susanna Grasha Hupp lost both her parents that day. The tragedy spurred her to a career in public service in the Texas House of Representatives. I helped pass the current concealed carry law in the state of Texas. Um, and then when I actually entered office, we made what I would consider improvements to that law. It is now legal to carry a concealed weapon in the state of Texas. I think if more states would pass laws like I tried to pass here in Texas, I think you will see the number of these random shootings go down dramatically. And I think when they do occur, you won't see the body bag count like we're seeing now. When going postal returns, an off-duty cop, a crowded shopping center, and an armed madman. Ken Hammond began the evening of February 12th, 2007, having a casual meal with his new wife. By the time the night ended, Hammond's courage helped save countless lives. Shocking act of violence number five, the Trolley Square Mall shootings. Trolley Square Mall in downtown Salt Lake City is a popular shopping center for locals and tourists alike. It's the second busiest tourist attraction in Salt Lake. It's an old trolley hub and they turned it into a mall. Off-duty police officer Ken Hammond and his pregnant wife Sarita had just finished dinner on the upper level of the mall. Valentine's Day was coming up. We both had to work on Valentine's Day, so I tried to plan a nice Valentine's date. At 6.44 p.m., an 18-year-old Bosnian refugee named Solomon Talovic arrived at the Trolley Square Mall. He came in on the first floor near the Cabin Fever card and gift shop. Solomon Talovic entered Trolley Square with a 12-gauge Mossberg pump-action shotgun with a pistol grip. He also carried a 38 revolver. Within seconds, three were dead, and two more lay wounded inside the card shop. And the first thing I remember seeing is broken glass to cabin fever. And I looked a little bit more, and then that's when I saw the victims, and I could see a lot of blood. And then I looked up, and then that's when I saw the suspect. The six-year police veteran spotted a dark-haired teenager in a tan trench coat spraying the mall with gunfire. I instantly knew that there was an active shooter. The shooter was fairly close, and he's coming around the corner, and he did shoot up at us. That's when Ken was pushing us out of the way. I really don't remember drawing my weapon. I was trying to identify myself to the people that were looking at me, who I was and what I was doing. That's the first time that I got scared, is because I didn't know where this guy was going. I'm not familiar with that mall. Hammond's gun held only eight bullets. Talavik carried hundreds of rounds in his backpack. I had a very limited amount of ammunition in the gun that I was carrying, and I didn't really feel comfortable taking a shot at that distance. So I kind of ran around to the left-hand side of the mall, right directly above Cabin Fever. Talavik noticed Hammond and began firing. And he focused his attention on Sarita and I, and he began to shoot. And I don't know how many times he shot at us, two or three times. The only thing I remember looking at was the gun. 
Salt Lake City Patrol Sergeant Andy Oblad was just three blocks away when the shooting started. As terrified shoppers fled, Oblad entered the building. He soon ran into Ken Hammond. He saw my uniform and realized I was an officer and wanted to identify himself. So he was yelling, OPD, OPD. He was holding a gun, but he wasn't pointing it at me. Just the way he was acting, the way he was dressed, for some reason I knew he was an off-duty officer. He kind of flags me down towards him. I felt that at least if I was next to a uniform officer, the other officers that were responding in wouldn't see me as a threat. Wedding videographer Jaron Dancy managed to record some of the chaos on his video camera. I've always got a camera with me and I always like to capture things. I start to see the first cop come in and they're kind of going a certain direction so I'm thinking that he's over there and so I keep filming and then at that point realize that they've spotted him, they know where he's at. Gunfire is engaging. You can hear by his shotgun blasts, he was shooting at the police. Oblad and Hammond cornered the shooter in Pottery Barn Kids. He seemed very methodical. It seemed like he was determined and had a plan. In the meantime, calls began to flood the 911 lines. Ken's wife, Sarita, was one of the callers. Please let them know that my husband is an Ogden City cop. He's off duty. He does have his gun, and he's out there somewhere. Your husband does? Yeah, he has his back and gun, but he's off duty, Ogden City. It seemed like forever, especially when you're hearing the gunshots. And knowing that my husband's out there and not knowing who's shooting. Where is it still a shooter? Is that Ken shooting? Is his back up there? Within three minutes of the first 911 call, a team of six Salt Lake City SWAT officers arrived on the scene. If we had delayed any longer or had decided to set up around the mall, he could have killed close to 100 people. In a stroke of good fortune, they entered the very store where the gunman was trapped. We picked that door going into Pottery Barn Kids. As soon as we entered that door, we could hear the shotgun uh, going off. We didn't think that we were going to be going right into the store that he was. So it was quite surprising. At that point, we didn't realize um, that Sergeant Oblad or Officer Hammond were inside the mall. So we didn't realize he was shooting at them. We thought he was shooting at more victims out in the hallway. Just six minutes after the first shots were fired, Sergeant Josh Sharman and his SWAT team brought Talavik's rampage to an end. When we shot him and he went to the ground and, and we secured him, I, what I remember seeing was that you know, he was a kid and it really blew our minds that we just shot a kid and to this day we don't know why. Five lives were lost that day in addition to the gunman's. If Sergeant Oblad and Officer Hammond weren't able to encounter him so early into this and change his course, the victim count would have been much higher. Within three minutes of receiving the call in our dispatch center, officers had arrived at Trolley Square. And within six minutes, we had reports that the suspect was contained. That is an amazing response. I don't mind if people want to refer to me as a hero, but what bothers me is if they single out one guy like Ken because he was off duty or me because I was one of the first ones there. I can think of 15 or 20 officers that went in the same way I did. We don't get into this line of work for the praises. We don't get in line, this line of work for the pats on the back. We do it because we like to do it and try to make an impact. Ken is awesome. That's a situation you never want to be put in, but I can't imagine anybody else that would react better in that situation. He's everything to me, so he's my hero. Coming up, a schoolhouse in a quiet community becomes the scene of every parent's worst nightmare. When a community founded on simplicity and peace is targeted by a truck driver filled with hate, a single room school becomes a killing field. Shocking act of violence number four, the Amish schoolhouse massacre. October 2nd, 2006, Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania. 32 year old father of three, Charles Roberts, leaves suicide notes for his wife. Robert's suicide note actually indicate that he was angry at God for the premature death of his infant daughter who died just shortly after birth. He suggested that this was uh, going to be an act of revenge. Five minutes from his home, 
Roberts pulls into the gravel-covered lot outside a tiny Amish schoolhouse. Inside, 26 boys and girls, ages 6 to 13, sit at their desks. The time is 10.25 a.m. Nobody knows why Mr. Roberts chose his particular school. It wasn't because they were Amish. It just happened to be the close proximity, where he lived, where he could get to. There's no security. It's easy to drive right up. And inside were the type of victims he was looking for, defenseless young female children. Roberts enters the school. He scans the classroom, then leaves, only to return moments later, this time brandishing a 9 millimeter semi-automatic weapon. He started waving his gun around, and he's like, everybody up front. At this point, the teacher has a decision to make. She sees an opportunity to escape. So at the time that the children are being moved to the front of the classroom, she runs out the door and runs as fast as she can. The teacher sprints for the nearest phone at a farm a quarter of a mile away. Meantime, Robert separates the boys from the girls. He orders the boys to unload his truck. But this wasn't an impulsive act. Roberts had spent a couple of weeks gathering supplies. I believe that he planned on being there for a significant amount of time and keeping law enforcement at bay while he did whatever it was that he planned to do. Then suddenly he said, OK, all the boys out. And then he was by himself with the girls in the classroom. Ten girls and a young teacher's aide remain. Roberts binds the girls' feet with plastic ties, boards up the windows, and barricades the door. Outside, the teacher reaches the farm and calls 911. Our personnel were dispatched at 38 minutes after the hour, and we had people on the scene in seven minutes. I don't believe he anticipated we would arrive that quickly. And part of the reason that we did was because the teacher made the difficult decision to go out and get help. At 10.48 a.m., the police try to establish contact. Roberts is in no mood to talk. He warned the police that if they didn't leave the premises or get out of the way, he was going to open fire. Then, at 11.05, gunfire erupts. And he just started shooting away at them, just started at the top and just shot down the row. The troopers immediately tried to get in the school. The police smashed the windows to gain entry, but it is too late. He sees the trooper smash out the window. At that time, Roberts turns the gun on himself, fires one round, and falls to the floor. Five of the ten girls die at the scene or at the hospital. The others, including the teacher's aide, somehow survive. This whole community was really shaken up by the shooting, as the whole world was. Over $4 million was sent in to help the families that were affected by the shooting. The Amish used part of that money to establish a fund for the gunman's widow and their three children. They extended their sympathies to her. They visited her, and they let her know that they are not harboring ill feelings toward her. In our culture, we tend to view forgiveness as the last step in healing. The Amish do it exactly opposite, that they forgive first and then go through the healing process. A week after the massacre, the yellow one-room school was torn down. The demolition of the old school had happened so quick, and by noontime this thing was done, and the land that it set on was seeded in grass. Unless you know where the school was, uh, you won't be able to find it. I mean, they completely took it to the ground. On April 2nd, 2007, six months to the day after the attack, another Amish school opened. When we return, mayhem at a Midwestern mall. Without hope, without faith, without courage. That's how Robert A. Hawkins' mother described her son to reporters. To his victims, Hawkins showed he was also without pity. Shocking act of violence number three is the West Roads Mall shooting. It was early December 2007. Employees and customers at the popular West Roads shopping center in Omaha, Nebraska were caught up in the holiday rush. 
19-year-old Robert Hawkins wasn't in the Christmas spirit. He had a history of drug use, a history of mental illness problems. Apparently he was sent for a psychiatric evaluation at one point, but there was very little follow-up. On December 4th, Hawkins stole his stepfather's assault rifle from a closet. The gun was not locked, the gun was not hidden, the ammunition was not kept separately. The next morning, Hawkins left suicide notes for friends and family. She talked about being depressed. He talked about being a burden to people and claims that he just snapped. Hawkins then drove his 1995 Jeep Laredo 12 miles to the West Roads Mall in Omaha. The 19-year-old entered the mall through the Von Mar department store. He entered the elevator, went straight to the third floor, and when he came out of the third floor, he had a, an assault rifle. Hawkins opened fire on shoppers and employees. The first frantic 911 call came in at 1.43 p.m. 911, what's your emergency? Hello, 911. There was one person shot on the first floor, uh, one person shot on the second floor, and all the other victims were on the third floor. Von Mar's HR manager, Jody Longmire, was one of the people who dialed 911. I am on the third floor. That's where most of the um, people have been shot are at. Okay, how many people do you have that are shot there? As far as I can tell, I have um, two to roughly four. Police and paramedics arrived at the store within six minutes of the first phone call. At that time, there was a, quite a few cruisers pulling up and getting out their assault weapons, so I immediately asked uh, you know, if the scene was secure, and uh, they said that the shooter was still possibly inside. But it was already too late. The gun is laying by, over by customer service. There's an officer there now. It looks like he might have killed himself. Okay, you see him laying by, by a gun? I see him laying by a gun. Hawkins' final act was to turn the assault rifle on himself. Shortly after the initial entry was made by the police officers, paramedics were bought in with police and were able to basically triage the situation. What we had here wasn't just a regular shooting, that we actually had uh, very close to a mass casualty. Five women and three men, ages 24 to 65, lost their lives that day. Four more were seriously wounded. During the event, you're just focused on your job, but later on, you start you know, seeing the names, seeing the faces, and you're going, oh my gosh, you know, because we all have families. It hits home. And that was what made it even harder. Once you start to get to know uh, the people that passed away, um, it was just senseless. Up next, incredible stories of those who fought to survive. Two angry, alienated students. One unselfish teacher. None survived shocking act of violence number two, the Columbine High School Massacre. Nothing like this had really happened at a school before. And I think this incident really woke up America. Certain events leave an indelible scar on history, like the events of April 20th, 1999. 11.30 a.m., first lunch period at Columbine High School near Littleton, Colorado. One moment, classmates Richard Castaldo and Rachel Scott were eating on the grass outside the cafeteria. The next moment? They shot me and uh, Rachel at the same time, basically. I was sitting down and I like fell backward onto my back and uh, I felt my, um, like brought the middle of my chest down, start to, you know, go numb. Rachel didn't survive. Columbine students Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold detailed their plans for more than a year in both written journals and videotapes. Why didn't somebody say, well, this is crazy, let's stop? Well, you look at those tapes and you'll know why it never stopped. Because all they did was reinforce each other for every violent suggestion and every violent behavior. These were two kids from everything I have read who were fascinated by killing. Columbine was not an end state for them. That was the beginning. Their intent was to go on a much larger rampage. It simply didn't play out that way. 
The morning of April 20th, Harris and Klebold left two homemade 20-pound propane and shrapnel bombs in their high school cafeteria. The explosives were set to go off at 11.17. They spent a lot of time planning this out, even so far as to go into the cafeteria and on a 10 or 15 minute basis, writing down how many kids were in the cafeteria. And then when the number of kids in the cafeteria got to the highest level, that's when they set their timer to go off. When the bombs failed to detonate, Harrison Klebold decided to investigate. That's when the boys came across Richard and Rachel. One of them, I'm not sure which one, like threw a, a pipe bomb. It didn't really do what they, what they wanted it to do, I guess, but they started just started shooting like just right, right after that. 15-year-old Daniel Rohrbaugh died near the stairs. Inside, many students assumed the shooting was some kind of senior prank. But business teacher Dave Sanders immediately recognized the threat. Dave Sanders, at the sound of gunshots and screaming, raced towards the violence and the action, ran into the cafeteria and tried to save students. Due to Sanders' quick thinking, the lunchroom was nearly empty by the time Klebold and Harris entered. There are probably untold numbers of heroic acts where kids acted to save other kids and, and adults did the same. As students ran for their lives, Sanders took to the halls, sounding the alarm. Then, in an upstairs corridor near the library, he found himself face to face with the gunman. Sanders turned to flee. Klebold shot him in the back. Sixty students and five teachers ended up in Doug Johnson's biology lab. Mr. Sanders was brought into the room, carried by two teachers, and he had been shot twice, and he was just pouring blood. 911 calls came into police from all over campus. Okay, has anybody been injured, ma'am? Yes. Okay. Yes. And the school is in a panic, and I'm in the library. I've got students down on the table, kids. We need police here. We need okay. Police. okay, we're getting them there. Smoke is coming in from out there, and I'm a little okay. The gun is right outside the library door, okay? I don't think I'm going to go out there, okay? In seven and a half minutes, Klebold and Harris executed 10 of their classmates in the library. Then they left to look for more victims. Meanwhile, the students in Mr. Johnson's room tried to keep Dave Sanders alive. We had pulled out his wallet and we had asked him about the pictures in it, which had his wife, his daughters, and his grandchildren. I think it, it helped um, that day him being surrounded by his students. I know that, um, I know he felt very loved. Hundreds of police and SWAT team officers surrounded the school as the students began to evacuate. In the midst of the chaos, some students showed nearly superhuman courage in their efforts to escape. There was a, a young man, Patrick Ireland, who was shot and dragged himself over to the window and sort of got himself out the window as people watched. 46 minutes after the shooting started, Klebold and Harris returned to the library. The two set off one last Molotov cocktail, then they both committed suicide. By the time paramedics made it to the science room where Dave Sanders lay bleeding, it was too late. It was because of him that I think so many were saved and knew to run out of the cafeteria that day. And he did give his life to get them out. Thirteen died at Columbine High School that day, not counting the gunmen. I still see the parents of the kids whose family I notified, and I know who they are, and they know who I am, because that's a moment that is seared in your mind forever, really. Twenty-three people were injured, some, like Richard Castaldo, permanently. I felt my legs go numb pretty much instantly, and I guess I didn't really know exactly what that meant at the time, but probably like within a couple of days, I think I, someone actually told me that was, you know, a spinal cord injury. I don't know how much the rest of the nation or even the world knows how much the victims of Columbine suffer, even the ones who weren't shot that day. It's been almost nine years and so many of us still can't talk about it. You just thought about what had been robbed from them and, uh, and you just knew that they were in a really special time in their life and this had really destroyed that in many respects. 
In the wake of Columbine, many lessons were learned. We've set up um, a Safe to Tell program with a program that is about school safety centers. And it'll really help school districts around the state plan for school safety. All of the disciplines who would normally be called on to respond are now talking about it beforehand. One of the lessons learned there was, hey, we need to bring these groups together in advance, get on the same page and wavelength so that we can effectively uh, respond to a crisis. Coming up, we'll meet one man who stared death in the face. April 16th, 2007. Blacksburg, Virginia would become forever linked to one of the most brutal murder sprees in U.S. history. Shocking act of violence number one, the Virginia Tech Massacre. On the morning of April 16th, biological sciences major Derek O'Dell didn't want to get out of bed. There was already a dusting of snow on the ground and more snow was coming down. So it was sort of like one of those, do I want to go to class or not? But in my first class that morning at 8 a.m., I had a, an exam that morning, so it wasn't really an option for me. 76-year-old engineering professor Liviu Labrescu, a Holocaust survivor, was preparing to teach solid mechanics. I heard from many students that he was one of the greatest engineering professors to have, that he just inspired them all and was definitely passionate about what he was teaching them. 23-year-old English major Sung Hui Cho also rose early that morning, but he didn't go to class. We had a young man who, from a, a very young age, had been disturbed and had been socially maladjusted. He had trouble relating or speaking to people. Around 7.15 a.m., Cho entered the West Ambler Johnston dormitory. There, on the fourth floor, outside room 4040, Cho crossed paths with 18-year-old freshman Emily Hilsher. Cho shot and killed her. Before he left the dorm, Cho also killed Hilsher's next-door neighbor, 22-year-old resident advisor Ryan Clark. There was a lot of speculation in the media right away that the shooter had some relationship with the female there. But there's no indication of that whatsoever. Two hours later, across campus in Norris Hall, Derek O'Dell's German class was beginning. Right around 9.20 or so, there was a person who looked into our class, maybe like a law student or something. They just opened the door briefly and looked in. Uh, but what was really odd was, like maybe two or three seconds after he looked in the first time, he reopened the door and looked in a second time. Around 9.40, Derek and his classmates heard a series of loud popping sounds. When we first heard the noises, it was just like, almost like this loud nail gun uh, pressing, like firing against like cinder blocks or concrete blocks. I think subconsciously, everybody sort of had this inherent fear that those noises were in fact gunshot. Professor Kevin Granada heard the noise from his office on the third floor. Kevin Granada got the students from the classroom across the hall who were in an unlocked room and their professor he brought them to his office and locked them in and said i've got to go downstairs and do something about this the other professor looked at him and said are you sure you really want to do that none of those students were hurt he was killed as he moved toward the gunfire two minutes passed then the man who peered into derek's classroom returned it was sung hui cho he shot a professor first, then he immediately swung the gun around uh, and started firing around onto the students. He sort of just shot people in as close as range as possible, just making sure that pretty much everybody was dead. Few escaped Cho's fury, including Derek. I looked into his eyes and then saw down the barrel of his gun. And I had to do something at that point. I slipped underneath my desk, and at that point he fired two shots. One went into my arm, and the other went just above my shoulder and missed. He had shot 11 out of the 13 people in our class. He probably realized that he had made a fairly significant amount of damage in our classroom. Cho left. Derek had to act quickly. I sort of jumped on top of the desk that I was hiding under and then just sprinted to the front of the classroom as quick as I could. And I threw the door shut because the gunshots were still coming from down the hall. And I figured uh, if I was at the doorway and he came back, then uh, there's no way that I'd survive. 
By this point, 911 calls flooded into local law enforcement. Police raced for the building's main entrance, only to find Cho had anticipated their arrival. He put a chain around the bars that you would push to open the door and lock them shut. So police officers had a difficult time entering the building. So they had to shoot down the doors and students were there waiting, trying to escape the building. Derek listened helplessly as Cho took the lives of 10 more students and their professor in the intermediate French class next door. Three other people in the class who were still conscious and able to get up and move around. They were trying to find uh, something to barricade the door with. Pretty much the only option was to put our bodies in front of the door, hold it as long as we could until the police arrived. Across the hall, Professor Lebrescu and his class heard the gunfire and the screams. There's no doubt in my mind that his experiences during the Holocaust, his desire for freedom, his desire for justice, no doubt influenced how he acted. He heard the gunshots and, and barricaded the door, put his desk in front of the door and was trying to hold the door shut. And he was instructing students to jump out of the window. And so students were, you know, helping each other out of the window and climbing down the side of the building. Nine students managed to escape before Labrescu was shot to death through the door. Then Cho turned his attention back to Derek's classroom. We saw the door handle rotate down, and then almost immediately we felt this force against the door. I think he was a little bit frustrated that he couldn't get into our classroom. After he fired those three or four shots into our classroom uh, through the door, uh, he sort of just immediately left down the hall. It was speculated that he heard the police sirens or, or heard police trying to get in the door, and so he got scared and killed himself. But he had enough ammunition where he could have kept going. Investigators estimate Cho fired more than 200 rounds from two different semi-automatic pistols. In all, 27 students and five teachers lost their lives. The anger, the confusion, uh, it was really difficult for the students, the idea that the shooter was one of them. Days later, thousands of fellow Hokies gathered to mourn at a candlelight vigil. Standing at the top of the hill and looking down, you could just see tens of thousands of little flickering candles in the darkness. I got out of the hospital the day before. My mom had recommended that I attend because it was sort of giving me some type of closure. In the weeks after the shooting, the Virginia Review Panel was formed to examine how Virginia Tech responded. The Virginia Review Panel found that Tech really wasn't 100% at fault. They had done things that were questionable, and, and there are obviously things that could have done better. Could Virginia Tech have been prevented, especially because there was a two and a half hour gap in time between the first shooting in the co-ed residence hall and later when the 30 additional people were killed? The police investigation revealed many clues that Cho was mentally unstable and obsessed with violence. There were warning signs that Cho Sung Wee was severely and deeply mentally disturbed. So much so that he could not even participate in class. His writings were very bizarre and definitely raised flags, red flags. Following the shootings, Virginia Tech debated the future of Norris Hall, where 30 of the 32 fatalities occurred. There were people who said that it should be torn down. It was a place of unimaginable tragedy. And if it ever opened, it should be transformed quite drastically. The former classrooms are going to be turned into laboratories for high-level research in engineering, science, and mechanics, particularly in biomechanics. The scholars there are doing the research and doing the kinds of things that Kevin Granada had dedicated his life to. These days, the university is still trying to move on. I think since the shooting, my life has changed. I sort of look at every day as a blessing that somehow I survived, that when five of my classmates couldn't make it out of my class, I don't take it for granted. If I let the tragedy define me, then it's sort of a way of letting the gunman win. He gets his ultimate wish of not only killing 32 people, but he destroys the lives of those who survived. Mm -hmm.